Good morning, good morning. If I haven't met you, and we're so glad you're worshiping with us online, as well as those who are gathered here, I'm Chip Freed, the lead teaching pastor. I got a little scruff on my face because I uh, just spent a week up in the Canadian wilderness on a lake uh, fishing, um, and my wife and I always have a deal. When I come back, I have to wear the beard for one week, one week only. Um, then I have to shave it off. But I realized if I didn't grow this today, I would be like in the minority up here. I mean, I, they, 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 there's a beard game going on up here, and I'm glad to be part of it. When I was at Colgate University, I played uh, basketball, I went on a basketball scholarship, and uh, one year we had to grow beards for a cause, and our captain, one of my best friends, Eric Jones, says, don't mind our point guard, his beard comes in by mail order, because it doesn't grow as well as these guys, but I'm trying to keep up. Um, and today, we are, it's Father's Day, and we thought we would ask some young dads, uh, Pastor Caleb, my son Perry. Uh, Caleb decided to have four all at once. Uh, Perry's trying to catch up with my granddaughter over here. Uh, and Steve and I, I learned last week, we're seasoned fathers. We're not old guys. We're seasoned. We're seasoned, right? Um, salt and pepper. My wife said when my beard came in this time, she said, honey, it's not red anymore. Um, it's, it's white. So... Uh, deal with that. But we thought, what would dad say? You know, dads are really kind of misunderstood in some ways. Do you know where Father's Day cards ranks in Hallmark as far as the holidays? Dead last. Mother's Day is number one, Christmas number two. We're like 19, dad. Um, but it's okay. It's okay. So just a perspective, um, what do dads need most? on Father's Day? That's our question. We heard the scripture where Jesus said, hey, even when your earthly father blows it, he doesn't give you a snake instead of an egg. How much more does your heavenly father love you? So Pastor Caleb's going to kick us off and we'll get going. You don't get 30 minutes of me, you get five or six from all of us. All right, come on, Caleb. <laughs> man, it's a, a joy to be with you here on Father's Day this year. And um, man, I just got to say, it's a wonderful blessing to be a father. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? There's nothing like it. When you become a parent and you, you see your child born and come into this world and have life, it's such a miracle. I, I don't know how to describe it. But here, let me, let me show you guys my family. There, we were um, going up in the Gateway Arch in St. Louis uh, a couple months back. But that's all four of my kids and my wife. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, there's the arch above us on the right picture. but And then that's from Mother's Day over there. So those are kind of like the best, most recent photos I have of all of my kids and my family. Let's see what's next. Oh, oh yeah, there we go. There was Christmas. So yeah, I've got four beautiful babies. Got to watch all of them be born and um, see that miracle of life happen. And like I said, there's nothing like it. And all in this one moment... As a father, you feel this awe for the miracle of life and how beautiful it is. You look into their eyes, into their face, and you see a reflection of yourself in them. It's like, this is a tiny little version of me. I don't know how to describe it. And I had this instant bond. Like when Roman was born, I just remember, I've never felt connected to another human being the way that I do with my son. Mm. Um, and I've, ha I've you know, had the joy of feeling that and experiencing with four kids. But there was one other thing that happened I also felt this incredible weight of responsibility come on me, that suddenly this tiny little being was depending on me for everything, that nobody else is going to step in and take care of this kid. It's, it's on me and my wife, you know, but I felt this incredible sense of responsibility. I want to give them the best life possible, every good gift that I could think of. I want to give them love, a home, you know, plenty of food. I want to give them a, a good future, set them up for success. All of this stuff, I felt all that weight in one instant moment. And I think for many dads, or for many of us, we might even look at our dads as heroes. They're people that we look up to, we, we admire them, we aspire to be like them. You know, they're the, the, the men in our lives who are strong. They're the men in our lives who provide. They're the people in our lives who are looking out for us and taking care of us, protecting us. And so they kind of have this heroic persona. And I read this beautiful story of this man named Chip Reese. And 
In June 2010, his son Ollie was born with Down syndrome. And he had some complications, had to have a couple of surgeries. And as he grew up though, you know, getting through those hurdles, um, you know, and different complications, his son Ollie began to have this interest in comic books and superheroes. And I really relate with Ollie because I love superheroes. Um, and so he's getting into this, but his dad Chip realized there's nobody in these books. There's no characters like Ollie, anybody that he can relate to who has Down syndrome. And he's not gonna see himself represented in these books. And so his dad thought, what can I do about this? And he decided without any knowledge at all of how to get this done, that he was gonna create a new comic book with a character that had Down syndrome like Ollie, so that Ollie would have somebody that he could see representing him. And his dad went through all this work, got an artist, got, got funding, got the book published, and um, it was a small success, but I think for Ollie, that was a huge success and a life-changing moment for him. But, I, but today, he'd be about 14 years old, and I think if you asked Ollie, you know, is that character your dad made, you know, your hero? I think he'd say, no, my dad's my real hero. And I think all of us have probably seen dads do really incredible things like that. We have moments and sparks in our lives where we really step up and we're the hero in the kid's life, um, in our children's lives. But if you're like me, you probably feel like you're an imposter sometimes. I know many dads probably experience that. We're putting on that persona of being a hero for our children. We're putting on the mask, we're putting on the cape, we're stepping in, we're trying to be strong, to provide, to protect, to be an image of somebody that they can aspire to be like. But we have faults and we have failures and we make mistakes and we fall short sometimes. And I don't know about you, but that gets to me. Sometimes it makes me feel like I'm an imposter, like I'm incompetent, like I don't have what it takes to be the best dad possible for my kids. Mm -hmm. And you bear that burden and that weight. And a lot of times because we're trying to show up so much for our kids, we internalize it and we try to hide it. It's like our secret identity. Secretly, I'm totally broken, but every day I'm putting on that cape and I'm stepping out anyways to show up for my family. That's what a good dad is. And I think what dads really need, the one thing I would say that dads really need um, this Father's Day is grace. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reminded of a, of a scripture. Let's see. Oops. Yeah, here we go. What dads need is grace. Thank you. You guys are helping me back there. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. This grace that, that this passage is talking about here, the scripture, it's the favor of Christ that assists and strengthens us. You know, if you're a father and you're hearing my words today, I wanna encourage you, you were never meant to be everything that your kids need. Come on. You were never meant to be perfect, to have it all together all the time. You have a heavenly father who wants to supply you with all the strength that you're lacking, who wants to give you all the power that you're lacking, all the love that you're lacking, and all the areas where you feel weak and insufficient and incapable of showing up as a father, his grace is there to assist you, to strengthen you, and to give you the power that you lack. It says that his grace is strong when you're weak. And I needed that reminder today. You know, I think instead of relying on my own abilities as a dad, on what I think is good, on just trying to copy what my dad did, or these incredible men around me who are awesome examples, just trying to be as good of a father as they are, you know, I think I gotta remind myself, I have a heavenly father who's looking out for me, and he has every intention of supporting me as I learn and I navigate how to be a dad. Even when I fall, even when I come short, He's giving me that grace. Beautiful thing is Thayer's Greek lexicon describes this grace as kindness, let's see, kindness that bestows upon one that which he does not deserve. I think for those of you who are spouses and partners and children, if you're adult children, it might be a little bit easier, family, friends, and you know a dad, I think today if you could give them some grace, 
that when they don't deserve the love, the affection, the admiration, the honor, when you're not feeling it because they made a mistake, because they came up short, because they disappointed you in some way, could we try to give them some grace today? Let's give them what they don't deserve. Let's support them, let's assist them so that they can show up and be that superhero to their kids. Amen. 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 Oh, yeah. All right. Can you all hear me? Good. All right, all right. So I want it for the record that uh, I did time my dad's intro. Um, it was a minute and 28 seconds, which I think is the shortest amount of time he's ever spoken up here. So for the record, you got it? All right, you got a time. Um, no, I'm so um, blessed and happy to be here. Um, normally, when I come up on the stage, I usually accept a bribe as far as like lunch or babysitting my daughter. So I figure what better gift to give to my dad than just give him five minutes off today. So happy Father's Day. <laughs> um, but no, this is uh, my beautiful family, my daughter, Corinne, who's now 16 months. Why do you just choke up all the time once you become a dad? I can't even just talk straight. But my beautiful daughter who's here, she's back there in the middle aisle just calling my name. He keeps saying his papa. I think it's daddy. Whatever. Nonetheless, um, it's my moment, okay? Um, and then my beautiful wife, uh, Alexandra, who's in the front here, happily married for five years. I'll say happily. She may. May or may not disagree, but, um, but yeah, I, I come up here as a newer dad with the opportunity to really talk about what dads need most on Father's Day. Um, I'm going to put a little spin on it and, on the title, and instead I just kind of want to challenge us to take today's words from amazing fathers who are both well-seasoned and newer, uh, like myself, and really just take it in as Words that we need every day and not just today. Mm. It's very important that, like my dad said with cards, acknowledgement for one day is only short-lived until you can acknowledge somebody long-term. So having said that, my word I wanted to share today is the word appreciation. So there's many ways that we can say the word appreciate. As many of us can be appreciative of something that happens to us, some favor that somebody gives or an experience we have, right? We can also feel appreciated for someone that did something for us. What I'm specifically wanting to speak on today is the verb and the action of appreciate. Appreciating our fathers and appreciating our spouses or significant others, those that we have in those titles with us. So why is appreciation so important? So to begin, I wanted to share one of two definitions, the word appreciation. The first being to value or regard highly or to place a high worth on. I'll say it again. To value or regard highly to place high worth on. So what this brings to mind is that feeling as a father of my own and a husband and even thinking about my dad. It's just that feeling of being valued, being worthy, feeling that you're, you're just doing enough. Um, it is imperative that we as both children, significant others, and people who have just father figures around, whether it's an exact father, stepfather, whatever the case, that we allow those who present themselves as worthy figures in our lives, that we just give them a chance to be themselves, to love them, to show them, like Caleb said, show them grace. There's, quite, there's a quote I read that um, explains appreciation pretty well that I really wanted to share. If, if you do not show appreciation to those that deserve it, the person will learn to stop doing the things that you really appreciate. Mm. Now, one way I wanted to relate this story, and I don't think my wife is ready for this, so bear in there, baby. Um, so one of my favorite things to do is to dress my daughter in the morning 
I don't have the hair down yet. I'm really working on it. It's hard. It's tough, especially with bigger fingers. You, okay. <laughs> so I do my best. I try to get her dressed, you know, relieve my wife of some of the duties. And we got to rush and toddler running down with diaper on and whatever I can do to help. Sometimes I won't have the outfit in the way that my wife wants. The way that I can tell is after I bring her in, we're ready to go. She goes, oh, wow. <laughs> So there's different ways of appreciation that you can see and experience. <laughs> and whether that be from your spouse or even my daughter, who all she has to say is, Daddy, hi, bye, because the kids have a more innocent mind. They're not there yet to where they can try and expose you for the outfits that you put on them. But I know I'm sure it's coming. We talk about in church all the time, he is worthy to be praised. Praise God. He is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy. And it's because of the love that we have for God and that we feel from God. But we as spouses and fathers, significant others, we want that same love. That commitment that you give and show to God, your appreciation for him, you should provide the same to us. As a father and husband, there is nothing more fulfilling for me to feel that what I'm doing is great, it's helpful, it's loving, it's supportive, and just to hear the word that I am enough. Or wow, wow works too. <laughs> and I want to speak specifically to the spouses out there. Um, even if we don't always get it right as dads and as husbands, and we try our best, but we don't always do it right, or in the way that you like, or on time, we may mess up our daughter's hair or choose the wrong outfit and send them off to school. We may buy the opposite thing that you told us to buy, even though we have to list in our pocket. <laughs> Whatever the case may be, instead of stressing about what isn't, love and appreciate what is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the effort. It's the want to do something. Yeah. There's Mary and Eve, fathers, father figures, and whatnot. We all fall into that where we don't always necessarily want to do something. But if we're doing it, even a, out of the best and goodness of our heart, honey, that we mean it, we love you, we love the experience and just getting that opportunity to really show ourselves. So I think it's just so important to not only stress that love, in ways that you affirm somebody or tell them or thank you for doing this or I appreciate that. It also comes in action. Both forms are necessities. And I heard a great speech from Rabbi Manus Friedman. He had an interview specifically on spouses. And again, I'm speaking specifically on spouses of appreciation at this moment. Um, but in his interview, I took a little snippet. And one of the things he said, all human beings need to feel needed. This can be the case for men especially. One of the worst things that you can say to your spouse is, never mind, I'll do it myself. Anything the husband offers, accept it and accept it graciously. Give us credit for it. Even if it is not exactly what you pictured in your mind from him, because if you reject what he is giving, he will quit. I got another good story, and it will be short. So my wife has many nieces, and we took our daughter and our niece to uh, Easter celebration that they had in Tower City. Don't look at me. I see that you're looking at me on this story. So her niece wanted something to drink, and I did the husband thing to do. I said, no, I got it. I'll go into the store over here, and it was you know, kind of like a corner store where it had all types of juices and everything. Now, with our daughter, I try to keep it, you know, Nice juice or milk or water, just play it safe because I don't want to get in the argument if it's too much sugar or something else like that. But for my niece, I was thinking the same thing, but they didn't have a lot of that stuff. So I'm like, you know what? Let me just get her some lemonade. Grabbed the lemonade, went to the counter, purchased it, came back. As I'm walking back, I see my sister-in-law and my wife giving me this look, and all I have is a drink in my hand. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> like, it's a setup. And little do I know, I get this lemonade, and it's the blue drink Calypso lemonade that apparently is worse than a Red Bull as far as sugar. 
and I'm giving it to kids that are already off the rails. But because the thought was there and the love, my wife found a way to appreciate me in her own way. I won't share how that was, but, but in the end, that's, that's kind of what it's talking about as far as the quote I said, the definition of regarding someone highly to place a high worth on. So I'll end on this. Um, the last definition of appreciation that you can find is to be fully conscious of or be aware of or to detect. So again, I'll say to be fully conscious, aware, detecting what's going on around you. In order for us to do the things I previously mentioned, we must be more conscious and aware of the effort and acts that our fathers or spouses do for us. It's one thing to give a compliment. It's one thing to say thank you. It's one thing to give a hug. Why are you really present in that moment, taking in what effort that they're trying to put in? We do this by being more present together. Take a chance to just sit down and talk without the noise of phones and our kids. Or instead of texting your dad, go have dinner with them. Or if they're not close, just FaceTime them. And when you get that chance, just tell them how much you love them, how much you appreciate them. Whether it's present, whether it's something that they recently did, or just throughout life. Appreciation can go a long way. So I really challenge all of us today, as far as their appreciation, to just be more present and intentional in these moments. Be engaged with the ones that we love. And then ask yourself this question. <laughs> What can I do right now, right now in this very moment, to show appreciation to my father, my spouse, the person that I hold high, to show love in their way and not my own? Amen. Amen. Okay, I have three sons. Then my bae. All right, that's the oldest boy. That's the middle son. You know, the middle kids are always a little different. <laughs> right? That's, that's my youngest son, right? All of these dudes are different. Like, these, are, these dudes are like, this is, a, this is like a lawyer litigator kind of mindset. This guy is very artsy and creative. Like, for dad today, he would create stuff and slideshows and stuff like that. This guy, matter of fact, some, some of the people, Mr. McGahee knows this guy, Joe's son uh, at, at Cleveland Heights for years. And so, and it, so these are my boys. All right, so my presentation is, it, well, let me give you some more pictures here, okay. That's a bad picture, but these are my granddaughters, right? This girl right here, she's a funny one because she wasn't right here at first, but when this one got here, and you know how grandkids are, she decided that this was the spot for her. She didn't care anything about her. She just wanted to be in this spot, right? And so those are my grandbabies. Not all of them. I have nine of them now. Mm. Wow. <laughs> you praying for me? All right. So <laughs> and so what a dad needs most on Father's Day is to under, is understanding is my word, to understand the father's heart. Hold that for me, bro. Matter of fact, me and Chip were talking about, as they were giving their presentations, how we were reliving it. Like, oh, man, I remember that first time when that baby looked at me like, you leave our daddy. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. You feel fear. You feel panic, right? But God gives you grace, right? All right, so I, I wrote this out. I purposely did not go to scripture because I get theological. And I don't want to do that. I just want to share from my heart today about uh, what a father needs most, all right? So I've chosen understanding my heart. That's the biggest thing that I need for my son. They're all adult now. I, need them to I want them to understand my heart. So if you understand my heart, then you understand my hand. So we get to a certain age. And when I was a kid, my dad was like my hero. He's still my hero. You know, went on to be with the Lord 10 years ago. Right? But my dad was my hero, and his name was Scott. Right? So in my mind, my dad could do no wrong. He had flaws. I didn't care about those. My dad was my hero. I had him way up there. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Scott. <laughs> Scott, right there. Right? So what happened was as I grew a little older, 
and began to see him like, hey, man, dude, you, you, ain't, you ain't a hero. Typical kid. First, he's a hero. Now you mad at him about everything. Man, why can't you just be this? Why can't you just do it? So I, I took him from hero status to I love you. Like that. And then I began to understand <coughs> his heart. Mm -hmm. And once I understood his heart, I realized that big S on his chest didn't stand for Superman. It stood for Scott because that's his name. I understood his heart. Why is this important to me? Because when I began to understand my father's heart and understand him, it helped me understand myself. There's parts of us that comes from our parents. And particularly as men, oh man, I, I shared the story at the other meeting where uh, I was uh, at a hotel and they had a camera set up and I was frustrated about something. And so I was leaning over the counter like giving them one of them, like that, like that. And, and the camera caught the side view and guess who I saw? My daddy, I looked exactly like my daddy. I had the same pose, I had the same, you know. I'm like, oh snap, I'm growing into my daddy. <laughs> you can't run. <laughs> That'd be your daddy. So, but, but as I begin to understand his heart, the things he taught begin to make more sense. Who I was made more sense. It doesn't mean that I'm going to become him. It simply means that as a father, he laid a foundation, right? He set the mold. And whatever I'm going to be, I may be in contrast to him. Maybe it's something my dad was doing. And there's some things he was doing like, I'll never do that. But the that had to be defined for me to know not to do that. The that was still there, you see. He, he put that there. And other things he did great, I'm like, oh, I definitely have to do that. So I understood myself. I understood some of my proclivities. But, you know, I, I'm a high passion dude. And so was my daddy, right? We didn't know until he started drinking. But that's another story, you know. <laughs> hey, I, hey, I ain't mad at the man. That's how he handles stuff. <laughs> Till he met the Lord, that's how he handled things. But I understood, you know, why he would, watch this. Oh, you see, you got me going now. Watch this. So, like, my dad was a guy who loved the jazz and the blues, right? And so, we come home from church, and all the lights are on, because back in those days, church was ran late. We get on 1030, all the lights in the house are on, my dad's in his baggy blues with his cigar in his mouth, and he's playing Miles Davis. Mm. He's in the zone. And he's painting. And I'm like, why you do stuff like that? Until I got a little bit older, now I'm doing stuff like that. Like, ah, shit. Right? So there's a beauty, there's a beauty in it. There, there's a beauty in it. When I understood, and I want my sons to understand my heart so they can understand themselves. Mm -hmm. Understand parts of themselves. And, and the final part is this. When they understand the heart, they understand the hand, they understand why I did certain things, mm -hmm. why I taught certain things with much passion. Some of it was passion because I didn't want to make my mistake. Don't do that. We have a going joke in my family, and I, and I, I probably use it about twice a year. I said, look, boy, make your own mistakes. Don't be stealing my mistakes. Get your own mistakes. Why are you using my mistakes? <laughs> I already told you that mistake. So why would you do that? Find a, one of your own so you can own it. They laugh, but they know I'm serious as I say. Don't do that. So we're talking so much passion because we don't want them to fall. Where we fail, we never feel like we're enough. We're never. And let me say this: because something that Terry said really struck a chord in me. Uh, is this the only person on the planet that can give a father mm -hmm. the value he really has is his spouse. Mm -hmm. Period. You got to be the one to tell him, "Good job." We can't get affirmation. The children are too young. If I wait till they're forty, that's too late. It's the other one that says, I see your heart. I see what you're doing. Good job. Or, babe, thank you. The next time, maybe I'll dress her. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But no, don't get it wrong. You did a good job. The right shoe is on the right foot. The left shoe. Good job. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, let me, let me end. Okay. Beverly's probably watching this at home going, Daddy, stop. All right. Final thing, final thing. Understanding the heart, understanding it. And, and final is this. When they understand the heart, they come to know themselves better. It gives them the confidence to be fathers. 
right? It, see, we have real conversations now, which is fun because when they're a certain age, you can't have them because it degenerates to arguments and tears and all that stuff. Now they're at the age, I give them license. Look, man, there's something I did or said to you when I was growing up, you know, you mad about, just tell me. Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah, since you brought it up. <laughs> Remember that time? <laughs> Uh, give me grace, give me grace. But the beauty is now there's a conversation there, and we're able to give them the confidence to understand what they're in for. You know, I joke about it a lot, but the reality is fathers really are not appreciated. They, their role is not understood biblically. See, I'm going theological. It's not understood biblically. And when you understand it that way, then you will fully appreciate it. Like, oh, thank God. Final thing. Provision. This is one of, one, of my, one of my key lessons, Brother Chip. This was good. I did this for Steve. Son, provision. You are a provider. So you know what provision means? Me messing with words. Pro means ahead of time. Vision means see. God gives you insight to see ahead of time what's going to be needed and provide for it now. So if you're leading your family and you see something up there, and, and your wife may or may not see it, you have to have the confidence to produce it anyway, knowing what the end's going to be. pro vibe. And that's why I want them to know my heart. Because when they know their heart, they have to be confident in who they are and to be all that God wants them to be. They don't need to be me. They need to be themselves. All that God wants them to be and all they want to be. Amen. All right, I'm going to sum it up. These, this is my tribe, my best friend, my oldest daughter, this guy over here. Uh, give me Cleveland or give me death. I didn't know you had that on there, Perry. And Matt, you know what's amazing about my kids? They get lighter as they go. It's a really, uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Perry, Perry painted a little uh, heirloom that I have in our house. He had to paint the family, including our, our yellow lab. And all of them were different hues. I just thought that, you know, for the mouth of a child. And the, the girl back in the back who is saying Papa, um, not Daddy. That's, that's my, I heard, the, I heard Papa. Okay. Okay, all right. But anyhow. Oh, oh, and that's, yeah, I was up on a Canadian lake. I don't know how that fish got in there. That was 27 inches. It was a great lake trout. I think Pastor Terry did it. Oh, gosh, how did those get in there? I'm sorry. That's, that's a 10-pound pike. That was the largest lake trout caught on the lake this year. I, Terry must have put them in. 30 inches, 15 pounds. I, I don't know how those got in there, sorry. Um, my word is forgiveness. What do dads need most on Father's Day? Forgiveness. Forgive us, right? There's different kinds of forgiveness that aren't biblical. One kind is delayed retribution. I will forgive you, but I can't wait till you get it like you gave it to me. The other one is condescension. Uh, you know, I, I forgive you because I'm such a great Christian, but I'm going to let you see the wounds you inflicted on me every day. I woke up this morning, and this shirt was hanging, uh, a gift from my wife and my daughter, on my closet. And it said, Dad's son's first heroes, uh, daughter's first love. And I think that's true. You know, like Steve said, I, when my kids were little, I had an S on my chest. When they grew to be men and women, they found out dad has some fractures and flaws uh, like, like I do. And the greatest gift you can give a dad, a mom, a spouse, um, you know, a significant other, as my, my son said, is forgiveness. Forgive us, A, for not being moms, <laughs> and forgive us for being human. You know, we're as broken as anybody else. Each one of my children, when they were born, I held them in my arms, my daughter uh, as well. And I prayed that, that God would protect them from the sins of their father. That would take care of them. Generational curses, right? Would take them. My uh, spiritual mentor, Coleman Brown, my college chaplain who brought me to Christ, taught me two things. He said, one, being a father, here's what you have to understand. You bless your kids and you curse your kids with every decision that you make. And I, that, that's been true. And he said, and never forget, they're only loaned to you. They're not yours. They're God's. And they're on loan. And I have prayed to God many times. I've told my, the Lord, take care of your kids 
and help me be a good steward of the kids that you have loaned to me. Giving forgiveness. There's an apocryphal story. Yeah, my, my granddaughter's crying because she, you know, if I had to listen to me preach, I'd cry too. Um, but, you know, uh, there's a great story. There, there's something called the Apocrypha, if you're a biblical scholar. There were many writings way back in the early church. Some of them didn't make it into what they call the canon. In the, the Bible didn't uh, actually get canonized until the fourth century. And it's always amazing to me. You know when Christianity grew the most? The first three centuries before the Bible was ever published. And, and when, they, when they put the Bible into its form, there were some apocryphal writings. They felt, ah, these weren't as accurate. But there was one about Jesus' dad, his earthly dad. And it's an apocryphal writing called Joseph the Carpenter. And it's Joseph's life. And it's told through the words of Jesus. It's an amazing book. I, I reread it for this Father's Day. And as Joseph is dying, his earthly life, as he's dying, he does kind of a confession with his son Jesus. And he, he regrets certain things he did. One was, I was going to divorce your mom. Remember that? In, in Matthew, when he discovered Mary was pregnant and he was going to divorce her quietly. And he says to Jesus, I, I was so stupid. I didn't know what I was doing. The angel had to rescue me. And he confesses all the things he blew it in his life. You know what Jesus does in that story? He takes his dad's feet. He rubs him. He weeps. And he forgives him. And he said, you know, dad, you were just a man. I forgive you. The greatest gift my kids can give me is to forgive me when, when I blow it, when I'm not the, the superhero they thought I was. Um, and I, I got to tell you, th today's very emotional for me to be up here with my son. You know, my daughter, my son, my youngest son, they all contributed to this ministry for the last 20 years. Tiana started our whole cafe ministry. Perry and my daughter-in-law, Alex, were our youth pastors. Um, Matthew was a worship leader up here. Did they do it? because they love God, you bet. But don't think I don't know that they were supporting their dad. And let me tell you, Preacher's Kids is no walk in the park. Garfield is a wonderful, healthy church, but each of them caught hell because they were my kids in their ministry area, cutting words, things said about them that they didn't deserve, but they took it. Um, you know, when I left the corporate arena, Tiana, who's down here, she was eight years old. Perry was on the way when I gave up that life and I went into ministry. And I'll never forget, I was serving in a historically underserved community, low income, high crime. I'm working 80 hours a week. And my paycheck for the year was exactly what I made per month in the corporate arena. And Tian wanted to go in gymnastics class and I couldn't afford it. And we're driving home. Now, mind you, I'm working 80 hours a week. And she said to me, Dad, Remember when you had a job? <laughs> it's like, yeah, baby, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I and, but the fact that Perry's up here today with me, that Tiana's sitting right down there, and Matthew's worshiping with us online, you know what gift they're giving to me? I forgive you. I, I know your calling. I know you've honored God. It hasn't been easy. We wouldn't choose to be preacher's kids but we love you anyways. That's a gift. Give it to you. I came back from fishing. You saw my pictures. And I realized, you know, I've been very open here at this church. I had a very troubled relationship with my dad. But I realized, you know who taught me to fish? My dad. That's me sitting on his lap on Lake Samard up in Quebec. And I, I went back to that picture when I came home. And I said, that reminds me of something. I went back when I took my kids to that same lake. And there's me with my youngest son, Matthew, passing on that legacy. And you know what, friends? I put those two pictures together. They're exactly in the same place on that lake in Quebec. And in 2014, my dad asked me to come home or come down to Florida to preach for him at his church. I didn't want to do it, um, you know, with his new wife and all these things. I just didn't want to. Um, I was kind of... But I told my wife, if I don't do this, I'll regret it. So I went down and preached three services for him. On the Saturday before I preached, he had set up for us to go largemouth bass fishing. I hadn't fished with my dad 
since I was a kid. I don't like largemouth bass. I don't, I don't fish for them. I think people are stupid to pay $60,000 for a boat and cast it at a dock. I like to go out in the deep water, right? But my dad took us largemouth bass fishing. And on Saturdays, I don't like to do anything but prepare for my sermon. But I, I, I ended up, and here's my last time with my dad fishing. Back in 2014, we went out there and we caught bass together. And when we came off that lake, um, his wife asked him, how was today? My dad never cried. And he cried that day. He said, I prayed for a day like today. And I didn't realize that at the time. You know what he was asking for for me? Forgiveness. And luckily, even though I was brain dead and stupid, I gave it to him. And my kids have given that to me. And most importantly, our Heavenly Father has given it to us. Dads, moms, spouses, single moms, aunts, uncles. Um, you know what? As Caleb started this sermon off with, know the difference between your job of being a dad or a mom or a sister or a brother and know that your heavenly father in heaven says, even when your earthly parents screw it up and they're not going to give you a snake when they can give you an egg, they're doing the best they can. But guess what? I'm the father, I'm the mother, I'm the heavenly parent that's never put a child beyond my reach. What do we need most on Father's Day for me? Forgiveness. And the sign that you are a Christian is you give forgiveness to others, right? Jesus said, when you stand praying and you remember, oh my gosh, I got a grudge, forgive or your prayer won't even be heard by your Father in heaven. Let's be forgiven people who forgive others. Amen? Amen. I hope today's been a blessing to you. It's been a blessing to me. Uh, God bless us.